Now, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I title this Demonstration. Do you like demonstration? Yeah. I love demonstration. You know, you can say whatever you want, but if there's no demonstration, then I question you really know what you're talking about. You know, the Bible says that, that the Word of God comes with demonstration. What is demonstration? Well, it's God being demonstrative, right? In the midst of his people. It says that we work with Jesus. It says, these signs shall follow them that believe in the name of Jesus. They will lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. Shall recover, right? It didn't say you can lay hands on the sick and pray for them, and I'll determine whether or not anything is going to happen, right? It didn't say you can lay hands on the sick, but if they're not doing everything right, they're not going to get it, right? And there's so much wrong doctrine out there that takes away the goodness of our God. And you have to be like that little hamster on the wheel, just, ooh, you know, did I do enough? Did I turn the wheel enough? You know, am I, am I pleasing you? You know, and the Bible plainly says that faith pleases God. Now, does it mean that if I'm not in faith, then I'm not pleasing God? Well, he never gets displeased. That's the amazing thing. He has no displeasure for his children, right? That's why it's called a finished work. Come on, say it with me. Finished work. It's a done deal, right? And it says that God so loved the world. How did he love them? He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, if God was willing to give his only begotten son, then doesn't his love for us go deeper than you can even imagine or think, right? I mean, you know, you could ask, you know, how many of you, you know, would give your son, your firstborn son, for strangers? Huh? Come on. And hope that they appreciate it. No, he, he didn't do that. He so loved the world. Now think about it. Now here's where I'm bringing you is that is there a difference between his love and your love? See, our love is natural. Our love can be complicated at times, but our love is based mostly on us. It's self-centered, right? You're doing everything I like. I'm so exciting. I love you. Right? And yet if you do something that I don't like, then I don't like you anymore. Okay? But see how emotions, self-emotions come up and they don't care about truth. Right? It's about me, the way I feel. Come on. Is that a demonstration? How many of us demonstrate our emotions, whether they be negative or positive? Why? Because on the inside, our feelings and everything begin to build until where the emotional realm takes over. And, it's, it, and a lot of times it's negative. Sometimes it's positive. Sometimes we get too positive emotionally about something that we shouldn't be. I love the beach. <laughs> oh, just to lay there and do nothing. Come on. And somehow that sand is softer on Sunday. <laughs> the fish bite better. Not as many people on the water. Whatever it is. Come on. You see what I'm saying? See, we all have demonstration of something coming and building from the inside of us, right? 
I think it was just this last week that uh, Gracie was in a in a class and and they had them they handed them out uh, tubes of toothpaste. And they just emptied that toothpaste in, into these bowls. And it was like, this is so fun. You know, then the teacher said, now, put it back in the tube. Okay, everybody put it back in the tube before you can be dismissed. Well, there's some that are trying to stick it in there, you know. And you, you eventually say, you can't do it. And she says, that's like words. See, once you speak them, you really can't take them back. That's where we begin to base everything on forgiveness, right? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Did you mean to lie? Come on, Jesus said it this way. He's a little bit more pointed. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you're saying that what you said, you didn't mean to say it, and yet he says it comes from an abundance. It's an overflow. But we like to sidetrack it, right? And so it's not only a negative thing, but it's also a positive thing. There's, there's the flip side. There's reciprocals, right? Meaning that when you get the right thing in abundance in your heart, it's going to come out your mouth. Right? So when you're speaking things concerning fear because of what's going on around you or what's going on in the nation or what might happen or whatever it is, see, it's because you've opened your heart and you've accepted this abundance of fear and it's slipping through the lips. Right? And we say, oh, well, well I, I didn't really mean to say that. What I meant to say, hello? And it says that love cast out fear. Think of that. Love cast out fear. So if fear is flowing out your mouth, it's because there's a lack of love on the inside of there. Yeah. Have you ever found yourself fearful? about the economy, fearful about your bills, about your income. Well, see, if you change it with the love of God and you begin to fill your heart with the love of God, then things are going to change. What did he say? Say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. And if you doubt not in your heart, it will obey you. Therefore, when you pray, when you pray, believe that you have what you're praying for and you shall have it. Amen? So Jesus is teaching us some things. It isn't just about... How many times do you go to church during the week, right? I mean, we need to go more than we are. But anyway, it doesn't say, you know, what is, what is your hopes, right? It didn't say, what did the latest prophet say? It said, when your heart is full of God's word. Nothing against prophets, right? But it's easy to catch hold and jump on the bandwagon of prophets than it is to get down and read the Bible. What does the Bible say? (laughs) 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren... When I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know 
anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, that is a very powerful scripture right there. See, in our quest to know, you know, what's going to happen in the end days, when's the rapture, when's... He said, whoa, boys, sit down, relax, put your feet up, get a cup of coffee. Yeah. There's one main thing, Jesus Christ. What about Jesus? He was crucified, raised from the dead. He is our Lord, he's our God. Let's keep it simple. But see, we want to know everything else. But have you taken the time to know him? Taken to the time to know that he was the perfect sacrifice. What God would give a perfect sacrifice and strip the devil, then let him take out his church? Come on. See, sometimes we just need some common sense some wake up right everything isn't about some of this mystical stuff that's going on and everything but see that's where people want to take you because it gets me a lot of subscribers I sell a lot of books there's a very famous preacher I won't tell you who he is but he was talking about how he met with Joseph Prince because he didn't think that he was teaching truth and he really slandered him. Listen, God doesn't give you a spiritual gift so you can slander another preacher. Unless you feel threatened. And so Joseph kindly met with him personally and sat down and talked. And so he says, well, for the time being, I put my sanction on him for now because I believe he's, he's teaching the truth, not exactly the way I see it, but I see that he believes it and it's not really detrimental. And, and so for right now, he's okay. And I think, how big of you? I'll bet you Joseph is so relieved. <laughs> Come on. Okay. So this is one of the times that I did not restrain myself in writing a reply. My reply was what you're into and everything, it sells books. Because he wrote a book against what he called ultra grace. It's this grace phenomena that everyone, phenomena, for you are saved by grace, G-R-A-C-E, grace, and that through faith, name and claim it, blab it and grab it, Right? As Glory Copeland says, blab it, grab it, get it. <laughs> Name it, claim it, have it. Okay, that's where it really messes people up is because, because it works. Right? So he wrote me back and says, You think that I wrote this book to get money? I said, well, if a duck quacks. I'm definitely not their friend anymore. But it was true. And I believe that he needed to hear it, even though it came from somebody that he doesn't care if I exist, let alone not know that I do. But it's still the truth. It's still the truth. See, listen, people. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that there's going to be special crowns and rewards handed out to them who intellectually has an answer for everything. See, Paul's saying something here. 
Something here that the church, the worldwide church of God, the kingdom of God, has been missing for almost 2,000 years. And it happens every so often, right? We miss simplicity. Simplicity. In the simplicity of the gospel is demonstration. What happened to you when you finally yielded your heart to God and said, Jesus, I believe in you. Come into my life. And I turn myself over to you. There was a demonstration, right? Something happened on the inside. You became born again. Born from above. Born of God. And Peter says that we were born again by the precious seed from the loins of God himself. Something took place on the inside. And the moment that took place in Corinthians, Paul wrote, we become a new creation in Christ Jesus. A creation that never did exist before. And it says that we've become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. See, that's not our doing. Because we had nothing, we knew nothing, we could do nothing on that spiritual level until we yielded and in our heart we said, Jesus, I believe in you. And then by the power of God, which is grace, Something took place on the inside of us and we become new creations. New creations. At that moment, on God's side, through that grace, he made us righteous. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now in Romans, there's a verse that says, none is righteous, no, not one. But see, that was Paul showing under the old covenant that there was nothing you could do to become righteous. It was impossible. Showing that on our side, it is impossible for you to deserve Christ, for you to deserve anything that he did. You can't earn it. I don't care how sinless you can become, you still can't earn it because it only comes through your death by accepting and receiving the death of Christ. And if we're crucified with him, then we are raised from the dead inside him. And that's what grace does. And it's our faith believing that it's a finished work. It's a real deal. You don't say, Jesus, I accept and receive you, and, and then wait it out and see what happens, right? It's got to be a work of faith on the inside. I receive you. I'm born of God. Are you born of God? Are you born again? Yes. Did you accept and receive the Holy Spirit on the inside of you? Yes. Right? So then we're citizens of a kingdom. A kingdom that is invisible to this natural realm because they can't see it. But in the kingdom of God, righteousness reigns and prevails. Yes. And that by grace we have access into every single thing that Jesus has done for us. And trust me, he did everything before they nailed him on that cross. And he looked down and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then what? It's finished. He didn't do 99.9% of everything to do. He said, I've done everything you sent me to do. It's done. It's done. And then he gave up the ghost, right? Three days later, he arose from the dead. He just sat up, <gasps> breathed the air that he made, <clears throat> right? Took the napkin off, <clears throat> the stone rolled away, angels out there, and he walked out. How many of you know that things were different? In the natural, it looked the same. But see, what we didn't see was the, the devil was whipped and stripped. He lost all the keys, death, hell, and the grave. No more sting, right? Until we get certain preachers way back then, 
that just kind of infused it back in and try to make us be hamsters on a wheel, trying to earn something that God did, and you can't. That's the reason that there's so many scriptures that seem confusing to Christians because we've got a base and a foundation of religion that is an oxymoron to the truth, right? Now, watch this. I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. Man, there's some preachers that are so flowery. When you get through talking to them, your head's spinning. And you feel this big. And you say, how can I debate that? Simplicity. Simplicity. How many of you on Saturday, when you have two people come up dressed real nice and knock on your door, go hide in the bedroom? <laughs> Peek out the window. Oh no, they're here again. Right? Dave Roberson used to call them Jehovah's. I'm not against Jehovah Witness. I'm not. Because I've learned to love them. See, I would do what you do. I would go hide. I wouldn't, you know, and, and, and try to keep the dog quiet. <laughs> Until they, they left. Why? Because I was intimidated. See, they study and they practice. And it's always the newbie with an oldie <clears throat> that come. And you talk to the newbie, right? And then if they get stuck, then the oldie steps in, right? And so I said, God, how do I talk to them? So the first thing is you start studying the Bible, right? To have an answer to things. And, and the Lord said, no, that's not how you do it. He said, I'll show you what they do. He says, the first thing is they get you running through the Bible. They take you on a little trip, right? True. Whether it be the Mormons or whoever it is. It could be the Baptists. doesn't matter who it is. <laughs> and they start chasing you through the Bible because you're trying to play catch up and, and you want to you know, answer them with the scripture of what you believe, right? And he says, don't do that. He said, run them through the Bible. Come on. Run right off the bat. What do you do? You knock them off their track. And when they're knocked off their track, they're not sure where they're going. Number one, they think they're smarter than you. And so they want to prove it. Right? And so usually, you know, they'll say there is a kingdom, there isn't. I says, absolutely, amen, praise God, I believe in that. And I'll say, but I do have a question, because they want to go into, into these scriptures. I said, I do have a question before we get into any of that, right? I said, you believe that Michael the archangel is Jesus? And they look at you funny. See, that's not their track. See, I believe in going for the juggler <laughs> out the gate, right? So they're going to have to try to prove to me that the Bible actually says that. And usually it's like, well, it was nice talking to you. But see, I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to the new one. And so I began to share with them the love of God and the goodness of God that if the Christ wasn't the true only begotten Son of God, then the power of the Scriptures is futile. There's nothing there, right? But there is demonstration. There is demonstration. And the whole time, see, 
I'm praying. And I'm releasing the anointing in the life of God. And it binds up their brains. And it's hard for them to say anything, right? And so now I've got a place where I can begin to inject things. Come on now. It'll happen every time. Every time. Why? Because you're concerned about their soul. And you know the power of seed. When you say truth, it goes into their heart and they can't get away from it. Right? So here's the thing. No one can deny or remove your personal testimony and relationship with Jesus Christ and the Word of God. They may choose not to believe it, and that's fine. But see, they can't refute it because it's yours. It's truth. Once I was dead, but now I'm alive. Right? So we're talking about the demonstration power of the Word of God. And that's where our heart is, and that's where our faith is, is in the Word of God, right? Now watch this. He said, I didn't come with excellency. Excellency means prominence, that is superiority. Most teaching in mainline churches is excellent teaching, excellent speaking. When I say excellent, I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying it's prominent. It's prominent. If you have an organization that has 200 million members in it, they can stand up, see, with this boldness and preach what they want and not have to back it up with Scripture. Not really. Because they've got this source of authority behind them, but there's literally no demonstration. So that's what I begin to get into is this love, this love that is so unnatural and overwhelming and uncomprehensible that it pulled me in, it compelled me. I had to find out what this is all about, right? And I began to realize that when I received the Holy Spirit, then my eyes were opened up. And the thing that he began to show me is all those times in my past where he was right there with me. All the times that I should have died or, or should have got arrested or busted or whatever it was, he was right there and helped me. Now, I know people refute that, but you know what? You weren't there. You weren't there. He made me invisible to police officers one time. Now, people say, I don't believe that. I don't care. And I walk right down the hallway of an apartment complex. And one of them almost ran into me because they were looking for us but didn't know where we were. And it was two friends and me. And we walked right through there and they never did see us. They were talking to each other. We walked right in between them. And walked out of the building. Hello? God is a God of love. He's a good God. And when you come into this type of relationship, then you begin to read the Bible and you find out that it's ludicrous, insane, and stupid to try to follow your own life, your own lust, your own desire. They'll take you nowhere, no matter what they are. They'll take you nowhere. And the only way to get somewhere in life is through yielding to Christ, to the Holy Spirit, to this gift that he gave us of the wisdom of God, of the righteousness of God, 
And if we'll get into the Bible and find out who we really are in Christ, then our whole lives begin to change. It doesn't mean you'll never have any problems. The Bible says that Satan comes immediately for the word's sake. But it doesn't say that he has to get anything from us. Amen? Now look at this. Verse 3. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. This is Paul speaking. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Enticing means persuasive. But in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. He said, what? I wasn't trying to, to win you over with my expertise and, and, and my verbiage and, and all that stuff. He said, I came in power. I came in demonstration of spirit and power. Demonstration of spirit, demonstration of power. Demonstration, demonstration, demonstration. What is demonstration? Stripping demons that are working, whatever it is. To strip lack off people. To strip sickness off people. To strip whatever it is that hinders off of people. That's what he said, the word of God in me, coming out of me because of my compassion for you and God's love will strip everything away from you so that you'll be able to comprehend the love of God, the plan of God, the desire of God, right? One translation says, you'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you to let you in on God's master stroke, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophies. I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First, Jesus and who he is. Then Jesus and what he did. Jesus is crucified. I was unsure of how to go about this and felt totally inadequate. I was scared to death, if you want to know the truth. And so nothing I said could have impressed you or anyone else, as a matter of fact. But the message came through anyway. God's Spirit and God's power did it, which made it clear that your life of faith is a response to God's power, not to some fancy mental or emotional footwork by me or anybody else. It's what? It's the power of God. The kingdom of God is the power of God. It is demonstrated in the finished work of Christ. Christ stripped and whipped the devil. He stripped, he's whipped. And that's the viewpoint of which we've got to come. We see things going on all around us. We cannot be influenced and give, give heed to these things. I don't care if it's Antifa. I don't care if it's whatever color lives matter. Souls matter. Amen. Amen. And we stand up as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. We are above, not beneath. Yes. Our heart is the power source that changes nations. Yes. It's a, it, it, it just comes out of us, out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks and the words of faith go out and they penetrate darkness and the relieve it of all of its fear. You listen to me. We're headed for a great day of reckoning. We're going to see things fall apart supernaturally. All the evil, wicked people are going to begin to consume themselves. There's things that are going to happen. It's amazing. 
I don't know who some people think God is, but he's not the God they think. My daddy is not going to destroy our nation. We're smart enough to not stop at 10 righteous. We go right down to one, and it's me. But God, if there's one righteous, will you not stay your hand from destroying? Yes, if there's one righteous. Awesome, that's me. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We've got awesome, great things unfolding, and we need to be excited about what's taking place. Hallelujah. There's greater life than we've ever lived. Listen, every time you get down and you begin to pray and you begin to worship, it's not a cloud that comes in and says, do your best because your time's limited. Everything's going to fall apart. It's going to hell in the handbasket. You know? No, there's an excitement. Right? And listen, if I'm wrong, I'll apologize to you. I'm not wrong. God is not a liar that he should repent. Our whole nation isn't going to fall apart and God's going to say, well, you know, I had better things planned for you, but... (laughs) What? See, if he can get down to 10 righteous. Anybody else in here righteous? We got a whole lot more than 10. That's what we're looking for. Amen. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So be excited. Be joyful. And know that our better days are yet to come. Amen. Amen.